Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, this goes to the question A in the introduction. As we're talking about a help meet, this is lesson 7, by the way, lesson 7. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, let's just read that for a quick review. Who's got that? Carter? And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Okay, so the first question was, why did God make a help meet for man? Because it wasn't good for him to be alone. Not good for him to be alone. And what had happened just prior to this that leads into this statement? So they brought, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. they brought all the, he brought all the animals in front of Adam. And realized there's no companion for him. He's, they're different species. It's not, he needs somebody that's like him. Right. Frank, you have something? Well, I'm sorry. They didn't find any suitable for him. Right. And, you know, God had a plan to start with. He knew what he was going to do. It wasn't as though God was surprised. And it was really for Adam to see as those animals came before him. None of these. You, you can have a connection with. You, you need somebody who is like you, similar to you. And so God needed uh, created the companion for him because there was no suitable companion among the rest of creation. So God made a woman as a helper to man. And by the way, the, the King James, you know, I do love the King James. I grew up on the King James. King James... Don't misunderstand this. is a good translation, but boy, I do not like help me <laughs> because it's so archaic in, in our way of thinking. And the way brethren used to pronounce it was help me as it was one word, like that was the title for her or something. Uh, like wife, like help me. It's not. It's a help meet, which we want to define, which means suitable. Uh, for him, right and proper. So, helper, a helper in the New King James, comparable to him. So, what is that word helper there? What does that mean? Or what's it conveying? Okay, there's a kind of a partnership in there, but anything else? The uh, companion to him, Micah? Aid and assist. Cade, an aid to assist. So there's a very specific role or function for this woman. It's not, she's not brought in as strictly a co equal partner in the sense that, sort of like in some companies, you have co CEOs and they both have the same function, but they split things up in various ways. It's, it's not that idea. She is an aid to her husband. Uh, some of the other places it pops up in the Old Testament, this exact word, this Hebrew word here, uh, in Psalm 20, verse 2, talks about getting help from the sanctuary. And then Psalm 70, verse 5, it talks about the Lord is our help, our aid to assist us. And so there's nothing inferior implied in this. It's not she's substandard to the man. It's just saying that's her role in this relationship between the two. Now that word comparable, what is that? Did you note that in the lesson? This is an interesting word here. It literally carries the idea of front. So someone in front of you, the opposite, an opposite part, an opposite counterpart, if you will, a mate to you. Um, when Hagar was across from Ishmael, it used this word. When she laid him down, she thought he was going to die, and she went over and just gave up in despair. The angel came to her. She was, it was talking about their opposite of each other. Uh, the people of Egypt in the presence of Joseph are described this way. And it's just going to this point of there's a relationship. There, there's 
They're different. They're distinct. They have specific roles, but there's a relationship between them. You know, there's some people in this world that we're around, but we really don't have a relationship. Like I went to vote the other day. The only relationship I have with those people is they're citizens and they're out voting or something like that. But this this is the idea of a closer relationship. So a helper comparable to him. Um, let's go to John chapter 14. There's something I want us to think about again, and we need to emphasize this just simply because how the world will bombard Christians, bombard our children. They'll try to get to us in our mindset on this. In John 14, let's read verse 16 and then verse 26. John 14, 16. Who's got that? Charles? And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another help, that He may abide with you forever. And verse 26. But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom your Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things, and bring you to remembrance all things that I have said to you. Okay. So the Holy Spirit is described as a helper in the New Testament. How how are we to understand that? What's his relationship to those apostles? Is the Holy Spirit superior or inferior? Definitely superior. And it's just talking about that role or that function of aiding them in understanding God's will, understanding truth. So there's no indication or implication that it is. she's an aid to the man, that she is in some way lesser than man in person, in character, or anything like that. Now this word here, parakletos, um, means intercessor, counselor, comforter, advocate. Uh, in the Greek expositors, the expositors Greek Testament rather, it says literally an advocatus, and I think that's Latin for you people with Latin. Advocatus, am I right? Bingo, I got the expert right here. Okay, all right, so called to one age, especially in a court of justice, a comforter in the authorized version, which is the King James, is used in its original sense of strengthener. So the Holy Spirit was there to be a strengthener. Now I say all that just to, Get back to this idea, the wife being a helper comparable to her husband is there to be an aid, a strengthener. And it would include, at times, counsel and to comfort and to be an advocate for him. So think of it that way. It's a very vital, important, and beneficial role that the woman has in the husband-wife relationship. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 8 and 9 here. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. Who's got that for us? Go ahead, Tom. Well, man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Okay. So in thinking about that, one of the things the lesson book pointed out is that woman was uniquely made to be a companion to man. And what is it that this text brings out for us? What is unique about the woman? Okay, and, and how is that that she's part of the man? The, in the original, literally, how was she? She's not as Adam was, which was from the dust of the earth. She's from Adam's flesh itself. Okay, took of his rib. Literally, part of man was made into woman. And so there's a connection there, unlike between us and any other creature. You know, and the book mentioned this, dog is not man's best friend. You know, there's this idea that a, a man can have a dog and his dog loves him. 
and he loves his dog, and his dog understands, and all those kinds of things. Yeah, it's God gave us animals that we can love, and we enjoy, and bring happiness in different ways, and sometimes aggravation in different ways. But those animals simply don't have what it takes to have a true, deep, meaningful relationship with man. But the woman does because she's made from man. And then how does every other man get here? From woman. With the exception of Adam, every other human being that has ever been on this planet has been the product of a woman, right? Now, we know there's man and woman involved, but the woman... She carries the child. She gives birth to the child. So every man is from a woman. So there's a woman from a man, and then every man from a woman. And that just shows that unique relationship between the man and woman. She's uniquely made for him to be complementary to him. And would it be too much to say complete what he lacks? Usually, in most cases, they complement one another, and they, you know, provide what the other lacks. Yes, yes, they they're different natures, different makeups, and there's even different personalities within those different natures and makeup. But there's definitely a nature of women, and there's a nature of men, but they're made for each other. Completes the man, right? Exactly right. That's and that's why God created her to bring in that completeness that we alone are not complete. Zach, which is not to suggest <coughs> Genesis two that everything God had made was good except that man was a lot of oops. Let me try to make you know, it was already it was always part of His plan. It just didn't happen at the same time that Adam was created, so that we would have this relationship from man to woman, and that man through <coughs> woman. God purposely decided to create Eve next, not as a pattern of God, because he realized man couldn't get old, have companionship with animals. That wasn't the reason why. Right, exactly. This is all according to his divine plan. As is clearly seen, that takes us right to Genesis chapter 1. Let's read verses 27 and 28 to remind ourselves. God designed it so that there is a man and woman required in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Who's got that? Philip. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. All right, so under that section of be fruitful, question A was, what is the most basic example of a woman's suitability? So what is that? Give birth, carry a child. Give birth, carry a child, okay. We all realize we live in an insane world where they think men have a nature of women. They don't. It's not possible for them to be with child, to be pregnant. It's not possible. Never has been. Never will be. Woman is the only one that can carry a child. That's it. And that's one of the most basic things you can look at and realize humanity would not exist if there wasn't a man and a woman. If it was just a man, it would have stopped right there. But a man and a woman, they're compatible. Their very bodies are designed to be together. Where God saw that ahead of time, and He wanted mankind to replenish the earth as the command is given there, to be fruitful and multiply. 
And he knew ahead of time, need a woman to go with the man for that to be accomplished. Any other thoughts on that? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 15. Now this is in that context. Remember, 1 Timothy 2 verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence of all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And then he gets into the rationale behind that. Adam was first formed in Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And then verse 15, who's got that for us? Go ahead, Carter. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness. It's our people. Now, what's that stating for us there? Is it saying that a woman must physically give birth in order to go to heaven? No, it's not saying that. What, what is the point? There's a contrast here. Here's A woman's not permitted to do this, but what? Yes, and at the beginning of it, he, he emphasizes something there, though. The childbearing. There, there's, there's a role and a purpose that God has given for a man, a male. And there's a role and a purpose he's given for a female. And the man's purpose is to be that leader, to be the leader among God's people, that's, now, that's not her role. Now, she does have a role, and it's a very important role. It's a very vital role, and that is bearing children. Now, that's a general thing that he's talking about, but that's very important. And she should see that as something that's valuable, that's honorable, that's rewarding, that's fulfilling. How do people in our modern times maybe... I forget which generation, if it's Z or whatever it is. But the 20 and 30-somethings right now, what are they being told about childbearing? Does anybody know? I've heard you don't want to bring a child into this corrupt world. And that seems to me that it's crazy because we have to change this corrupt world. Okay. Don't bring a child into this chaos. Is there anything else? Too expensive, too much time. Too expensive, too much time. Why would you waste your time? Why would you waste your youth being burdened with little children? Micah? Okay. A big fat lie that's been told since I was your age probably before, overpopulation. I'll just tell you right now, that's not even possible. That is an imp If we purposely set out to overpopulate the earth, we could not do that. Okay? If you want to test me on that, test me on that. But I am a firm believer in that, just like we couldn't destroy the earth if we wanted to. Because God said, do what with the earth? Genesis 1, 28. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth, right? Go, go. Have, have children, have lots of children. That's what he's telling us here. So, the, the current generation of the 20, 30-somethings, and of course it goes down younger than that in many spheres, they discourage people from having children. There, there's a whole group of people out there that have come up in some of the discussions we've had lately in, within the family, or I know at least me and Elijah, they're called dinks. So anybody know what a dink is? What is it, Elaine? Double income, no kids, and that's supposed to be like the, the great life, right? Oh man, we got all kinds of money, we're not tied down, we can travel, we can go here, we can go there, we can spend the money on ourselves and all that. What does that create in people? 
What kind of people does that bring into our society? Selfish. Selfish. Purely, purely selfish people. Materialistic, short-sighted, selfish people. And I guarantee you, if, if they continue down that path in about 30 or 40 years, certainly in 50 years, when they get in their 70s and their 80s, they're going to be like, oh, wow, did I ever make a horrible mistake? So it's hard enough for people who are in their 70s and 80s who have family to get attention from their family. And if you have no kids, that's, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a very real problem. But anyways, so God intended for women to have children. It's a very vital role in the family. It's vital in the church. It's vital in society. And she needs to find joy and fulfillment in that role. Any other thoughts on that? All right, let's go to the next section of companionship. What can, and he talked about communication there. What's important about communication with the wife versus Fido? Two Okay, can you communicate with your dog? Those of you who have dogs, how far does that go? <laughs> yeah, just very simple things. Communication with your wife is infinitely more complex, deep, meaningful. And so... We can't have that communication with any other creation. And so a woman is fully suited to commune with man, to listen to with compassion and understanding, and provide comfort and encouragement. And I would like us to turn to Ecclesiastes 9. Ecclesiastes 9. And let's read verse 9. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9. Who's got this for us? Micah? Okay. So live joyfully with the wife whom you love. How long? All the days of your life. Okay, that's just another place in Scripture where it says you get married, you stay married for life. But he says live joyfully with her. How's that going to happen? When we're talking about this commune, this companionship, what does that mean? How are you going to do that? Are you going to be able to do that? Your wife says, you know what? I, I like living at the beach. I'm going to go live at the beach. And you go live in the mountains or you live near where you work. Is that going to work? You know, there are some people who they decide, well, we're married, but we're going to live apart. Well, what kind of marriage is that? You're not companions in that situation. So how, how can you be companions? What's required? Well, communication is key. Communication? Um, friendship. Friendship? Have to have, have to have that common viewpoint and thinking, you know, because otherwise you spend all your time trying to figure them out, you know, and you have to have something that binds you to begin with. Now, mostly it's faith in God, but also likes and dislikes. You know, if somebody, like, if somebody likes hunting and you're one of those that says, oh, you shouldn't kill any animals, that's horrible, I can't stand it. And every time, it's usually the guy, he says, I want to go hunting, and his wife is like, Oh, I can't, I'm, I'm so upset, I'm so disappointed in you and all this. You, know, you have to have this meeting of the minds, you know, 
and you have to communicate to each other. And one of the hardest things in marriage is to say what you're feeling. And it tends to be harder for men to do that, but it's also difficult for some women, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're afraid of what they're gonna say if you do come forth with what you're thinking, you know? And it's, it's an ongoing thing has to happen or before you know it you're just two people living in the same house right right you have to have that communication that openness with each other sharing with each other and to get to that point of there have to be some shared interests and sharing of activities bonnie well i also think um, that two words that come in mind that i think kind of go hand in hand is love and sacrifice mm-hmm in a good relationship with your mate. You have to have the love for them, but you also have to be willing to sacrifice some of what you think in order for their happiness. So to me, love and sacrifice goes hand in hand. Yes, they absolutely go hand in hand. And in this uh, companionship, this sharing together, you know, when the wise man says here, live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your life, he's he's the implied assumption in there is you're together living daily with each other as time goes by. That's the only way that you can really experience this. You have to be together. Now, it's not saying 24-7, 365. All right? Um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'll probably see a few expressions on your faces like this. But does anybody ever need a break away from your spouse? It's just, it's not that you don't love uh, Yeah. Uh, I like I didn't see that. Um, the, it, it's just, you know, you love each other dearly, but every so often it's good just to get out, just to spend a little time on your own, or you go... You know, if the guy's a hunter, hey, I'm going to go hunting, and you do your thing, and that's okay. That's okay. Now, if there's something else going on, there's a crisis with her, it's not like, I don't care. This is my hunting day. I'm gone. That's not the idea. But we can have individual things we do. We can do things with friends, and we need to have friends. She needs to have friends. Men need to have friends. But we have to live a life together and have some kind of shared interest, a good overlap of those things that we enjoy doing things together. Uh, we enjoy same types of things. Um, so that, that's a part of living joyfully with your wife all the days of your life. Time together helps to build the relationship with one another. And question B under that section said, cite things that interfere with a wife's role of companion to her husband. Now he listed out a bunch of things. What, what do you all have? Things that interfere with the wife being a companion to her husband. What's that? Their health. Their health? In what sense do you mean? Okay, it, it could be maybe she's not able to do things with her husband, not able to maybe go hiking, things they used to be able to do together. But he would adjust, a good husband's going to adjust in that situation. That's beyond her control, perhaps. Maybe it is within her control and she needs to you know, live a better life to be healthier so that she's not having those issues. That could be it. But is there anything else? Where it's like, this is pure choice. Um, do your career over husband or family? Career, right? Putting a career ahead of her husband. Well, you made a point earlier about being selfish. I think that comes back to play here again, choosing self over your spouse. Okay, yeah, choosing self over spouse that may be in the form of a career that she's like, well, I've got a career, I've got a degree, I, I've got my thing. Also, when you're raising kids, especially young kids, can cause problems. Not, not that it's a bad thing, but this is how. 
Okay. Yes, yes. So women can, when they have children, they're very young, they can become completely consumed with that child, and the husband is just left fending for himself. And that, that's an issue that causes a, a separation between the husband and wife in that relationship that was there. Um, anything else? How about family? Her mom? Her sisters? That's where she wants to be. When her husband has days off, she's always gone with mom. She's always gone with sisters. She doesn't have time for him. She's over there in the evenings doing those things with family, all of that. Uh, could be internet, could be television watching, that she's just consumed with those things and she doesn't pay any attention to her husband. I think the um, things in times past would be the, the soap opera wife. She would just sit there all day and watch those soap operas, right? So for those of you who are younger, you don't want to know, just leave it there. <laughs> all right, affection. How about affection? Uh, Titus 2, verse 4. Titus 2 and verse 4. Who's got that for us? Hank? It could have astonished them too. Yeah. But okay, to love their husbands, and this, this word here that he pointed out is the phileo love. And so the question A there was what did Paul say about the wife's affection for her husbands? What do you think about that? Let's go to Proverbs 25, verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11. Who's got that? Go, Caleb. Blessed he that heareth it, but be to shame. And not uh, Proverbs 25, 11. Yeah, Proverbs 25, Do you have a different one? I guess so, but word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and setting of silver. I think you were in verse 10 in your version. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so like, you know, a word fitly spoken is a wonderful thing. And so thinking about the affection and the wife having affection for her husband what kinds of things can a wife say to her husband that conveys her affection for him? Show appreciation for the things he does. Okay. Verbalizing that? Yeah. I appreciate you. Saying, you know, how much he appreciates, you know, what a good father he is, or, you know, how he takes care of them, and, you know, how he does things for her and all of that. You know, um, compliment, just compliment him, this person. Hey. But, you know, gee, you look great today. You know, That's uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Okay. All right. You know, it's hard, especially if he's a boss. Okay. Yeah. Words like, I have confidence you're going to figure this out. I know you're through a hard time. Just tell me what happened. And as he talks through it, he begins to relax. Yeah. He okay, I, I can handle this. It's, it's not as bad as I thought. But sometimes it's that way. Other times, it's, I, I just need to get it out. <laughs> right. And, you know, just as women need the words of affirmation and compliments and things like that, men need those things too. 
Uh, maybe not the exact same things, but, but they need that. There's other ways that a wife can show affection. You know, maybe just uh, holding his hand, grabbing and holding his hand, uh, uh, preparation of a meal, you know, a special meal maybe. Just, hey, I appreciate you. I care about you. I'm thinking about you. Things like that. Well, the next section in the book goes into the sexual needs of a man. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's read here verses 1 through 5. Who's got that for us? 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. Charles? Now concerning the thing of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not cry one another except for consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. All right. When we studied about the husband, we talked about this in here, in particular about the render to the wife the affection do her. We talked about that's a word that has the connotation of a debt. She owes it. He owes it to her. She owes it to him. It's the only place where this can lawfully be fulfilled is in that marriage relationship. And the wife needs to be mindful of that and not be grudging about it, but to express interest, to show interest in that so that her husband is able to enjoy that part of their relationship with each other. Uh, is this relationship, the sexual relationship, for procreation only? No. Right. Uh, there are some religions that have taught that, but it's not just for procreation. It's not just about having children. It's something in which the, the husband and wife can enjoy each other. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 talks about how the marriage bed is pure and undefiled. It, it's a good thing. It helps to bind the two together, to draw them to one another, to connect them. They, they connect physically, but they also connect emotionally in that relationship with each other. And so it's a healthy and a good thing that both husband and wife need to be mindful of. Well, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'll tell you what, let's jump to Titus 2. It's going to convey the same thing. Titus 2 and verse 5. And then we want to back up to Proverbs 31 with the remaining time. So Titus 2 verse 5, who's got that for us? Go ahead, Zach. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husband, that the word of God may not be revived. Okay, that working at home in other translations says what? Homemaker. What is a homemaker? Okay, housewife. Okay, it is a hard job. What does Paul say here? He also says it over in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. What does this convey to us? Verse 4, they admonish the young women, love their husbands, love their children, discreet, chaste. important it needs to be taught 
That's your job. That is your job. Wives are to be homemakers. They love their husband. They love their children. They take care of their children, take care of their husband. But they're to be homemakers. They're, they're not given the charge. Go out and work and provide for your family. They're not given that charge. Is there anything wrong with a woman working in certain circumstances? No, there's not. Especially we think of pre-children. There are women who will work for a time. But understand that this is a divine directive. Here's your sphere. Here's your role. Here, here's, here's why you're here. Because you're a helper comparable to man. You're an aid. You're a strengthener. You're an assistant to the man. Um, let's go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. I want to dig on this for a little while. So this, Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31, it's a poem, and if I'm saying the structure of the poem, it's a chiasmus. Okay. And when you go down through here, there's a point and a counterpoint. There, there are things that go together. And it all comes down to verse 23. Verse 23 is the main point of the entire poem here. Because you go down verses 10 through 22... It talks about the woman. The woman does this. The woman does that. The woman this and that and the other. And then all of a sudden in verse 23, your husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And then verse 24, it goes back to she makes linen and strength and honor her clothing. And she opens her mouth. with The, the writer here didn't just all of a sudden go, oh, I better say something about a man. It's the whole point of this. This is not written for the woman. The entire book of Proverbs is written for the young man from start to finish. And it's not saying it doesn't apply to women, not saying that this, doesn't, this isn't a good place for a woman to study, but this is for a young man and for his understanding about a woman. So here's, here's something about this chiasmus. It's a rhetorical or literary figure in which words, grammatical construction, concepts are repeated in reverse order in the same or a modified form. So it, it's giving these, these points. And as you, you go down through this, and I wish I brought the chart now that, that showed this, but it, you see these points down through here, how they parallel each other in reverse order. And it gets down to the main point of verse 23. And directed to that young man. So the New American Commentary makes this statement, this woman, this worthy woman here, is the kind of wife a man needs in order to be successful in life. And that's what this is what a young man is supposed to be looking for. Okay? And it serves, you understand that he's her Lord, yet he's dependent on her if he's going to attain the status of this wise elder who commands respect in the gate, which every man would want that. Respect of his peers, of the people in his community. And the thing that's going to help him get there is that worthy woman, that wife, who's going to be like this woman here. And so, young man, you, this is who you need to be looking for. Um, it's practical application of the woman of wisdom at the beginning of the book. And it's a counterpoint to both the immoral woman and the contentious wife that he speaks of earlier in the book as well. You don't want that. That's death. That's destruction. Here's where you're going to find life, health, strength, success is in this worthy woman. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, let's read verses 10 to 14. Who's got that for us? Proverbs 31, 10 to 14. Go ahead, Carter. You can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above her. Part of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. 
She is like the merchant of ships. She brings her food from afar. Okay. So, what do you get out of those first few verses there? What kind of woman is this? Very valuable. Above the jewels, above the rubies. Really, we could say invaluable. She's productive. One of the biggest things, like verse 15, she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. Um, and one of the things I read about that is, it's not necessarily that she is cooking for all of her maidservants, but she's overseeing making sure this is done. That goes back to that homemaker or manager of the house. She's making sure all these things are getting done. And it's just basically saying, She's working hard. She's very industrious. She's frugal. Elaine? Yes, very much strength here that she's helping that household, helping her husband in functioning how that house should function so he can focus on the things that he's doing. And, he's, and the thing about that is there are others who see her doing this. As she's going out into the community, as she's getting her goods, as she's going out and selling goods, it talks about later, you know, she considers a field, verse 16, she plants a vineyard, she girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms, she perceives her merchandise as good, her lamp does not go out by night, she's working hard, she's industrious, she's producing things in the house, making sure all of that gets done. There's clothing that is made uh, in verse uh, 19, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. So her hands are busy working, but verse 20, what else are her hands doing? She's reaching out to the poor. She's, so she's not just obsessed with that work day in and day out. She's also compassionate. There are others who are less fortunate. I'm going to help them out. So she's got a balance in her life here. And then in verse 21, it's interesting. Uh, who's got the New American Standard? Verse 21, what have you got? She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Okay. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. Um, she's well prepared. She's prepared her house. They are clothed appropriately to deal with what is ahead, whether that's snow, the harsh conditions, and whatnot. And I apologize. We're just going to have to leave that there. Maybe I'll come back and do a sermon on it at some point. But let's press on to lesson number eight next week, Lord willing, lesson eight.